Okay, so when firms think about their costs um, and they try to minimize their costs and to, and to reduce their fixed costs and reduce their variable costs so they can make more money, um, some interesting things happen um, as they produce more things. Sometimes if a firm starts doubling the inputs that they put in, they can create more than double of the outputs. And the other things happen as, um, as you start scaling up production. And so that's what we're going to talk about briefly here is this idea of scale and location and networks. And so there are three different things we're going to talk about here. There, there's this concept of economies of scale, which means that the cost to make stuff goes down as you make more stuff. Um, so here, if you like double the inputs, you can get more than double the outputs um, with economies of scale. You also have this idea of economies of agglomeration, which means the cost to make stuff goes down as people start clumping together. Um, as firms start locating physically next to each other, um, the cost for all of them to create stuff actually decreases and you can create more stuff. Um, and then there's this idea of network effects, where as people um, use your stuff, it actually makes it cheaper for you to create more stuff. And I'll, we'll, we'll talk about some examples of these here. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about economies of scale first, because this is kind of the most popular, most famous version of this. Um, so economies of scale just means that if you double the inputs, um, you get more than double the outputs. Um, and it doesn't always have to be double. It's just if you increase the inputs, you get more than that increase in the outputs. Um, so we see this all the time um, with uh, kind of creating stuff. Um, sometimes if you're trying to create like a single spoon, for instance, you have to build a whole factory to create that and you have to hire a whole bunch of people just to create one spoon. And so that's going to be crazy expensive to do, but the cost to make a second one, if you double the amount of stuff that you're purchasing, but you keep kind of the, the employees that you have in the factory, you have constant, you don't have to get a second factory for a second spoon. Um, it starts getting cheaper per spoon. Um, as you start scaling up how many spoons you're making. Um, this is visible in a graph here. So this is, um, this is showing um, the production of chocolate milk down here on the, on the x-axis and then the price on the y-axis here. And what we can look at here is the average total cost, this green line here, um, which starts off pretty expensive. To make one gallon of milk, it's fairly expensive to do that. As soon as you make two gallons of milk though, um, because you're kind of doubling up on the fixed costs that you have, um, the price to make that goes down. Um, and it becomes cheaper and cheaper to do that. And that is driven by this fixed cost here. If you look at the red line, as you make more stuff, your fixed costs go down significantly because you're still using the same factory. In the situation of this milk here, you're using one fridge. Um, to store all of the milk. And so you don't have to buy a second one, you can just keep using the same one. And so your fixed costs are going to go down over time. Um, but if you notice this green line, it's going down, and then somewhere here in the middle, it flattens out, and then it starts going up, which means it's becoming more expensive to make stuff. The reason it goes up is because the variable costs go up. As you're creating more and more milk, for instance, you have to buy more milk. You have to pay more employees. You have to buy more sugar. You have to buy more chocolate. You have to buy more of the variable costs. And that becomes more expensive the more stuff you make. If you make a million gallons of milk in one factory, that's going to be great, like really economical for your factory because you're creating a ton of stuff in one place. You only have to pay rent once. Um, but you're going to be spending tons of money on all of the milk and all of the employees and all of the sugar and all of the chocolate and all of the other variable costs. And so that is what is driving variable costs up. So if you look at the blue line, that's going up constantly here. So the green line is what we care about the most. This is the average total cost. So in the early stages of creating stuff, it actually becomes cheaper and cheaper to create stuff. And then you hit some sort of inflection point here, and then it starts getting more and more expensive to create stuff. Okay, and so this shape right here is a very common shape for costs. And um, you can actually change this um, over time. And so this is assuming like if you have just one factory, your costs are gonna go down, um, and then they're gonna come back up. But if you bought like a second factory, um, or did something with new fixed costs, um, bought, or um, hired a new employee, for instance, um, then you'd be able to 
essentially move to a new cost curve. What this looks like in real life, this is kind of a goofy looking smiley graph here. Um, you have something called short run average costs. Um, so that's the average cost going down and coming back up. And then you have long run average costs, which means like over time, that's gonna, like you can start decreasing your short run average costs where if it starts getting more expensive to make stuff, then you buy a second factory and then it gets cheaper again. And then it starts getting more expensive. And then you buy a second fridge and then buy another factory and then buy a whole bunch of more fridges. And so you're just expanding all of your fixed um, um, very, or fixed costs and your fixed assets. And then over time, that actually makes it cheaper and cheaper for you to create lots and lots of things. Um, and eventually you'll get to a point where it's just gonna be super expensive to, to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and so anytime you're in this world here, dropping from like, if you're increasing the stuff you're making and it gets cheaper to make that stuff, that is called economies of scale. Um, down here, right where it's flat, you have constant returns to scale. So if you're doubling your inputs, you're getting exactly double the outputs. And then in this world here, as the costs start increasing as you're making stuff, um, you get something called diseconomies of scale, where if you're doubling the amount of chocolate milk you're making, it actually costs more than double the cost to do that. And that, like, you generally don't want to be in that world because um, that is expensive. Um, so we don't want to, to deal with that. Okay, so next we have economies of agglomeration. And this is the idea that as firms start clumping together, it actually makes it cheaper for them to do stuff. Um, some classic, classic examples of this are like Detroit. Um, back in the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s, back when um, all of the, the major American car companies were based in Detroit, if you wanted to create steering wheels and be a steering wheel supplier for Ford or for Chevrolet or for Dodge or whoever, it was really wise to set up shop in Detroit um, because then you could create stuff and just send it across the street to the factories instead of building a factory down in like Texas and then shipping your steering wheels up north because that was a really long distance. You want to minimize your costs. And so um, if everybody kind of agglomerates in one place and everybody's kind of producing complementary products, um, it makes it cheaper for you to create stuff because right? you're minimizing your costs. Um, we see this today in Silicon Valley. Um, there's a reason why like Google and Facebook and Microsoft, or Microsoft up north in Seattle, but they're also clustered next to Amazon. Um, and so like there's a reason that is because they can kind of share knowledge, they can share employees. As, as one employee leaves Microsoft, they can go join Amazon. Um, if you're down in Silicon Valley, you can move from Apple to Facebook to Google um, fairly easily. Um, and so you have this whole community of, of people, of potential employees. Um, you also have all of the suppliers um, who, can, who can get their stuff to um, the different companies creating the products. Um, and so because you have kind of clusters of people or of firms that are very related, the costs go down. Um, this happens all over the place. Um, a few years ago, I was in Ghana before I knew what economies of agglomeration were. Um, and I was in one of the, the main vegetable markets. I was helping an NGO um, with some market research. We had to ask about different prices of tomatoes and cucumbers and things. And one of the things I noticed is that like all of the cucumber sellers clustered in the same part of the market and all of the tomato sellers clustered in the same part of the market. And me not knowing anything about economies of agglomeration, I thought that was like weird. Um, because you, you don't like in the United States, you typically don't want to have like a McDonald's next door to a Burger King next door to a Wendy's next door to like an Arby's because they're all kind of similar. You want to kind of spread out so that you don't have to compete with your next door neighbor. Um, you don't want to have like a Starbucks right next to a Dunkin Donuts um, because they both sell the same thing. And so if, if you're trying to attract new customers, that's going to be really hard to do. Um, and so in these markets where you have all of the cucumber sellers and all of the tomato sellers, that feels weird, but they do it on purpose because of economies of agglomeration. So when the suppliers bring their tomatoes in from, um, from the actual producers of the vegetables, they only have to make one stop in these markets and they can kind of drive up and dump all of their supplies and then sell their supplies to the, to the sellers in the market. And it makes it really cheap because you don't have to pay for extra shipping, basically, um, because you're already clustered in that one location. Um, and so it was a very good thing to do to cluster there. It makes it hard to differentiate yourself, but 
you don't really need to differentiate yourself if there's just a whole bunch of people selling basically the same thing. Um, we see this um, on freeways, for instance, in the United States. When you get off an exit, there are like three different gas stations um, and they all have the same price of gas. Um, and the only difference is basically where they're located at the different corners of the exit. And so if you're traveling northbound, you're going to go to one of them. If you're traveling southbound, you're going to go to the other. People aren't going to purposely like make a U-turn on, on some freeway to get to yours. It doesn't really matter. Um, so these gas stations can agglomerate in one location. And then it's cheaper for them to get supplied, to have the gas tankers come in and fill them all up at the same time. It's a lot cheaper to do that. Um, you see this with used car dealerships or new car dealerships. They typically cluster on the outskirts of cities all next to each other. Um, and that makes it cheaper and easier for um, train shipment of cars and um, kind of the big trucks with all of the, the cars stacked on top of the trailer. Um, that's expensive to ship these cars, but if you can get it so they only go to one place, it reduces the cost of shipping for everybody and makes everybody better off and lowers costs for everybody. And so this economies of agglomeration, you see this all over the place in the world. Um, the last thing that happens in the world here um, with costs is this idea of network effects, where if people start using your stuff, it actually makes it um, cheaper for them to keep using your stuff. Um, and the cost to do stuff goes down when everybody uses your stuff. And so we see this especially um, with the internet. Um, for instance, if you wanted to create a competitor to Craigslist, um, and be able to create a place where people can sell things and buy things. Um, that's going to be really hard to do because one, Craigslist already exists and two, Facebook Marketplace already exists and they're supplanting Craigslist right now. Um, and the reason why Facebook Marketplace is kind of taking over the world is because most people have Facebook accounts. Um, and so if you're a seller and you want to sell something to people, you could make your own website and payment processing platform and all of that stuff, but that's going to be hard. Or you can just sell stuff on Facebook Marketplace because you can just use that platform that already exists. Um, you can sell stuff on Amazon um, because that platform already exists and is cheaper for you to do it there because of this network effects idea. It's really hard to get people to move to a new network. Um, it, it, if, if everybody's already on Facebook or everybody already uses Amazon or everybody already uses Google, you can just, it's cheaper for them to get people to be on their platforms rather than you creating your own system. Um, and so if you can get somebody to lock in to your network, that's great for you as a firm because then your costs go down. And if you are a firm trying to sell things, it's also great for you because your costs go down. You don't have to handle payment anymore. You don't have to handle um, advertising. You can just tell Google to advertise things. You don't have to make your own advertising network. You can just rely on theirs. Um, and it makes costs go down, which means revenues go up, which means profits go up. And so firms love this type of stuff. Um, it's not always great for consumers because then you're kind of locked into these giant corporations and their huge networks. Um, but it's great for firms who want to be able to benefit from the lower costs of doing this stuff. So to practice identifying these different um, effects that you see in the world with costs, um, here are a whole bunch of different potential examples of economies of scale or economies of agglomeration or network effects or maybe nothing. So what I want you to do is pause this video, um, write down what you think each of these examples might be. Is it an example of economies of scale? Is it something with network effects? Is it something with economies of agglomeration? So go ahead and pause the video. I'll move myself out of here. Um, so pause this, write these things down, see what you can figure out um, based on your knowledge of what we just talked about. Okay, now that you're back, hopefully you actually paused it, um, let's talk about these things here and what they actually represent. So eBay and PayPal. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, eBay came first back in the late nine, early mid nineties. It was one of the, the early, um, internet companies that was part of the, the early dot com boom. Um, and they wanted to make it easy for people to pay for things in the auctions that they won on, on eBay. And so they partnered with PayPal. Um, to help process payments. And so they were able to make a partnership with PayPal as kind of the exclusive payment processor for eBay. 
Um, and so as a result, you had a very tight network between eBay and PayPal. And so it cost less for you to sell stuff on eBay because you could just use your existing PayPal account to do that. So this is a good example of network effects, this eBay and PayPal example. Um, if we go here, this QWERTY and Dvorak keyboards. So if you notice on your keyboard, 99.9% .9 of you have a keyboard that has Q-W-E-R-T-Y in the upper left corner. And that's because that's just kind of the keyboard that emerged back in the early days of creating computers. Um, it is uh, fairly streamlined for quick typing. Um, and so it's just kind of taken over. Um, this Dvorak keyboard is an alternative keyboard that some guy with the last name of Dvorak has decided is also really fast. He's done a whole bunch of research to prove that it is faster than QWERTY. Um, it moves the common vowels to the home row. And so instead of having like U, I, and O be up in the top corner like it is with a QWERTY keyboard, they're kind of on the main middle row. Um, it has been very, very hard for anybody to switch to Dvorak. You can if you want. In your system preferences on Windows or on Mac or on your phone, you can actually switch your keyboard to Dvorak. Um, and it's going to be really hard and miserable, and you'll switch right back to QWERTY. Um, and so this is an example of network effects here, where um, if you want to create your own Dvorak keyboard, it's not going to work. Um, if you want to create something that has a keyboard, um, you're going to use QWERTY, because that's what exists already in the world. So there's a reason that um, iPhones and Android phones, their on-screen keyboards that pop up, are QWERTY keyboards. Um, when you're working with like smart TVs or with like uh, the Amazon Fire Stick and other things like that, the on-screen keyboards that show up on your screen, um, if the if the interface is made well, is typically in a QWERTY format too, because we're familiar with typing that way. Um, some systems don't, and they'll just do like A, B, C, D, E, F, G um, all the way across alphabetically, and that's miserable to type um, because we're not used to it and because it's incredibly slow and inefficient. And so if you want to lower costs and increase kind of your user base, you basically stick with QWERTY because that's what exists out in the world. So this is another example of network effects um, where you get lower costs because everybody's using one type of thing and you just kind of stick with that thing. Okay, doubling a recipe. So again, the rule for economies of scale is that if you double the inputs, you get more than double the outputs. So lots of you may have said that this is not an example of economies of scale. If you double a recipe, you instead of one cup of flour, you do two cups of flour, you're gonna get twice as many cookies out of it. But inputs do not mean just the flour you're putting into the thing. It's the whole process. So if you have to stir um, a bowl full of flour and sugar and butter and other things like that, um, that takes time. If you double the recipe, you only have to stir once and it doesn't take twice as long to stir the bowl. Um, you can stir it in basically the same amount of time it would take to stir one, um, one version of the recipe. Um, when you cook it, when you put your stuff in the oven, you don't have to put one cookie sheet in and then wait for it to be done and then take it out and then preheat the oven again and then put the next cookie sheet in. You can put both cookie sheets in at the same time and be done in like half the time. And so this is actually an example of economies of scale um, because you're not like it doesn't come from the ingredients. It's not that magically because you added a second cup of flour, you have three times as many cookies. That's not happening. Um, but it does become faster and cheaper for you to create twice as many cookies because of the inputs from labor and the inputs from using the oven and the equipment and other things like that. And so again, you have economies of scale here. Um, you could have diseconomies of scale if you tried to multiply a recipe by 100 um, and you're only one person, that's actually going to slow you down um, because it's going to take a lot longer to mix all of the stuff. You're going to have to use multiple bowls. You're going to have to spend lots more time with the oven or find a second oven or a third oven. So that's going to, um, at that point, if you start adding more cookies, it's going to be more costly and more time consuming. But in the, if you're just going from one to two or one to three, if you're going to triple it, it actually has economies of scale and speeds up um, the amount of stuff that you create or the amount of time it takes to create stuff. And you can create more things in that same amount of time. Um, Walmart's distribution network. This hopefully you got because there's a network in there. 
its um, network effects here, but also in part agglomeration. Um, so Walmart and Amazon and uh, these other huge corporations are really good at getting stuff to you cheaply because they have a huge distribution network with places located all over the, the country um, so that they can get stuff to you really quickly. Um, and Amazon is really good at this actually. If you um, decide to put something in your Amazon cart and you just leave it there, um, behind the scenes, what often happens is Amazon will ship that thing to your nearest distribution center, which for us in Atlanta, I think, is in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, they might have one in Atlanta itself at this point, um, but they, they kind of have like a big warehouse there. And so internally, they use all sorts of algorithms and fancy decision-making tools to say, like, this person put this book in their cart and it's just sitting there. Let's just ship it to Chattanooga and let it sit there until they're ready to buy it and then once they're ready to buy it we'll ship it and it'll go super fast if they don't buy it that's fine it'll just sit there um, because somebody else might buy it or we can move it to a different warehouse um, but they can shuffle stuff around because they have this huge network of, of, of warehouses um, and so it, it's kind of cool it's kind of creepy too they use algorithms to predict what else you might buy based on your purchasing patterns and so they'll start shipping things that they think you're going to buy in the next few months to Chattanooga and it sits there until you buy it. And so some of the things that you're gonna buy on Amazon are already sitting in Tennessee waiting for you to buy it and you don't know it, which is incredibly creepy. Um, but that's how big data and artificial intelligence stuff works. Um, this is also helpful for sellers. If you want to sell something on Amazon, they have a system where you can just ship your stuff to one of their warehouses and then it gets put into that warehouse rotation thing. Um, and so if you're trying to sell to somebody um, you're in Atlanta and you're trying to sell, sell the, something to somebody in Seattle, um, it could be that that thing is already in the nearest uh, warehouse to Seattle um, just because it got into their system and that reduces your shipping costs and it reduces your cost to manage your own storefront and to do other things because you're relying on Amazon's network. So good example of network right there. Um, Costco here, that's an example of economies of scale. Um, it's cheaper to buy lots of things at Costco, like lots of big things. Um, if you go to Kroger and buy 50 pounds of flour, you're going to have to buy like 50 individual bags of flour. Um, and those are more expensive per pound than just buying one giant bag of flour at Costco for, or a 50 pound bag of flour. And so you get economies of scale there. That's the whole reason for Costco existing. That's the whole reason for like wholesale restaurant suppliers to exist. They sell lots of things for cheaper than you would get if you just bought like a whole bunch of individual small things. Um, Henry Ford's assembly line is a good example of economies of scale, um, where by um, changing the order of, of how things were constructed, um, they were actually able to create more things in the same period of time. And so they were able to essentially double their inputs and get more than double the outputs and be super hyper productive. And that was because of specialization and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but it made it so that they were more efficient in creating stuff. And then this last example here, rural Chinese moving to cities. Um, part of the reason China has been so explosive with their um, economic growth over the past couple of decades is because um, they've been able to build huge factories that create all of the electronics that you use, your iPhones and your computers and your TV screens and your monitors and everything. Um, and that's because of economies of agglomeration. You have whole sections of cities that are dedicated to a specific smartphone part. Um, you have whole factories that are dedicated to just putting a screen on an iPhone and that's the one thing they do. Um, or soldering a couple specific processor parts onto a graphics chip and that's what the factory does. Um, and everything is kind of agglomerated into one central location in these different cities that just specialize in specific technology. And so that's a good example of this network effects, um, or not network, network effects, economies of agglomeration here, where it's cheaper to make stuff because everybody's clustered together. It's kind of like a modern or a, a Chinese version of Silicon Valley or a Chinese version of Detroit. Um, where everybody can be clustered together. It's cheaper to do stuff because you can just ship your stuff down to the next factory down the street and um, it's faster to create stuff. So that's how you can see these different um, ideas of economies of scale, economies of agglomeration and network effects in the real world. Um, one thing that's fun now that you know about this is just 
pay attention to things that you see and try to see if there are economies of scale or agglomeration. If you see a whole bunch of gas stations all clustered together, there's probably a reason and it's an agglomeration story. So pay attention to these things in the world and you'll, you'll start seeing them all over the place.